Hello, everyone. Hello, high level listeners. Welcome back to episode 18 of our advanced English podcast at High Level Listening. Today, we're diving into the exciting topic of planning a vacation. We'll be chatting about a variety of phrases and vocabulary that are commonly used in both American and British English. I'm Kat. I'm the American teacher from the United States. I'll be showcasing American English phrases and idioms and expressions commonly used when talking about vacation planning. And my name's Mark, the British voice here at High Level Listening. So I'll be sharing British English expressions and vocabulary rated, related to planning a holiday, as we call it in England. So we've got vacations in America, holidays in the UK. We'll discuss more of these differences as we go through. If you'd like to follow along word by word to take your studying to the next level, we also have members only PDF transcripts for our high level listeners. Just visit the memberships tab on YouTube and join the community for access to downloadable PDF transcripts for over 20 videos. In this episode, like always, we'll each read a script about planning a holiday or a vacation. My script will feature more British English words and expressions as usual, while Kat's will be more focused on American English. In this week, our actual holiday preferences are a little bit different in some places, but this episode will still give you a great side-by-side -side comparison of holiday planning in English-speaking countries. After reading our scripts, we'll dissect each sentence and phrase, giving you a deeper understanding of the vocabulary and expressions. We'd love to hear more about your plans for a vacation or a holiday down in the comments below. We read and reply to every comment, so we can't wait to see what you guys have written. Okay, I'll kick things off by asking Kat the question. How do you go about planning your vacations? Actually, I have a weekend getaway planned in a couple of weeks since I saw a good last minute deal pop up. Normally when it comes to vacation planning, I start by making a list of destinations and whittle it down based on flight prices. I really prefer direct flights, but I'll definitely book a connecting flight if the price is right. Booking off season helps a lot since I usually want to avoid the crowds during the peak season anyway. Instead of booking a big hotel chain, I like to stay in smaller boutique hotels or a B&B &B with a host and something homemade for breakfast. As far as sightseeing goes, I usually like to sign up for a city tour with a local guide to get my bearings and then do some adventuring on my own, eating and drinking along the way. Now, as Mark said, I would normally talk about my vacation in American English, and he'll talk about his holiday. So, Mark, how do you go about planning a holiday? Next month, I'm going away on a proper two-week holiday with the family. When sorting out my holidays, I'll have an idea of where I want to go, then use flight prices to narrow it down. So I'll usually start by scouring the internet for flights to compare prices and try to find ones that are reasonably priced without any ridiculous layovers. That's also why we typically try to travel in shoulder seasons. That way we can avoid the big tourist rush and maybe nab a bargain in the process. I spend a good chunk of time reading reviews online for all-inclusive resorts, ones that have everything taken care of. Then when it comes to actual sightseeing, I know we can simply book a tour at the front desk, then just sit back and relax and enjoy ourselves. That sounds super nice. So yeah, what we're so going to do now, <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to take a moment to take apart each piece of our script. We'll go sentence by sentence and compare side by side, American versus British English. Now, like Mark said, our scripts are going to be a little bit different for this episode. I have kind of chosen more of a boutique hotel and kind of an independent look at the city. And Mark's chosen something more like an all-inclusive where everything is taken care of. So our vacations are going to be a little bit different, but we still have lots of great expressions here for you. So I'll ask Kat first, what is the next trip you have planned? 
Actually, I have a weekend getaway planned in a couple of weeks since I saw a good last minute deal pop up. So I like this word in English, actually. Actually, actually means, <laughs> in this sentence, it means surprisingly. Oh, I surprisingly have a weekend getaway planned in the next couple of weeks. So funny you should ask, actually, or surprisingly, I have a weekend getaway planned. A weekend getaway is kind of a, a short weekend trip. A getaway, getaway, <laughs> a weekend getaway is a trip where you leave the city. It could be close by, maybe you'll drive, it could be a short flight away, but you're really just spending a weekend away, a weekend getaway. Now, I have a weekend getaway planned in a couple of weeks. Since I saw a good last minute deal pop up, a last minute deal. Now, if you do something at the last minute, you really don't have much time to do it. You are some, whatever you need to do is happening very soon. So a last minute project, a last minute flight, a last minute hotel, that means that they have space and you probably need to leave in the next couple of weeks or even in the next couple of days. And they're willing to give you a deal, a discount, a last minute deal, a last minute discount, that would be a reduction in price because it's happening really soon. Then our last word, a last minute deal that popped up. Let's see, what did I say? I saw a good last minute deal pop up. Now, sometimes you are just scrolling on your phone, looking around, and all of a sudden you get an email. It pops up on your screen and you think, hmm, a oh, last minute trip. Hmm, I could could use a getaway, could use a little, a little vacation, a little time away. So if something pops up, could be a notification on your phone, you might be on a website and you might be looking at flights for a vacation in a few months and something pops up like an advertisement and it says last minute deal, last minute discounts. You know, I just couldn't resist looking at the deals to see, are they really good deals? Are they kind of are they kind of cheap? So I looked at those and I decided, yeah, that's a pretty good discount. I'll book a weekend getaway. All right. So uh, Mark, what? Yes. Sorry. I was thinking if you had a, a last minute weekend getaway, I would imagine that if you said I booked a last minute getaway on Wednesday or something, then I imagine that you are going on Friday or Saturday. Like last minute is super, super close. Like you barely have time to pack and like get everything organized. And that could be fun, like and exciting. Do you like to travel that way at the last minute? Not usually, I'll be honest. If I travel at the last minute, um, there's just a lot of things going on. I might have to change my work schedule. But this one, I booked it pretty last minute and we're leaving in a couple of weeks. So they actually gave me enough time to plan it. And this flight that I'm taking is not very far away. So the place that we want to go isn't very far away. It's not like I'm traveling across the world this weekend, right? I'm just traveling <laughs> on a kind of a last minute flight, not too far away. So what about you? What's the next trip you have planned? Next month, I'm going away on a proper two week holiday with the family. So there's a few phrases in here. Next month, I'm going away. Uh, this is a case where native speakers like to add uh, extra phrasal verb to make it more casual. But in this case, I'm also doing it to add a bit of emphasis. I'm going on vacation, yes, but I'm going away on holiday. Away makes it sound like I'm going far away. Like I'm probably going abroad. I'm going to another country. I'm probably going across an ocean or somewhere six hours, seven hours away. So the UK to Mexico or I don't know, the UK to Thailand, somewhere far away. I'm going away. I think away also adds this feeling of no calls, no emails, 
no work. I'm going away from my boring everyday life. So Please it's don't like, bother me. <laughs> yeah, it's like, don't contact me. Don't email me. I am going away, away from all of this so I can properly relax. So I'm saying this because I have a longer holiday, two weeks, and I'm saying it because I'm going far away. And I'm also saying this because, yeah, I want to cut myself off from work and my everyday life. I'm going away. <laughs> um, I'm going away for a proper two-week holiday. Proper. A lot of people use this in the UK to mean like a holiday that I can really, really enjoy. A proper two-week holiday gives me lots and lots of time to properly relax and rest. Like if we sat down and we had a proper chat, a proper chat sounds like quite a long chat, a, a chat long enough where we really get to understand each other and talk about something fully. So I'm going to fully enjoy my holiday by having a proper two-week holiday. And I'm going with the family. It's totally correct if I said I'm going on holiday with my family, but here I wanted to show you, you can say the family. The is the article, so it's the specific family that I'm a part of. And it's another way to say my family. I'm going with the family. So that's my wife and the two children. They are the family. They are my family. So you can use either one. Uh, do people say that in the States as well? Definitely. And if I'm going to shorten that, I would say, yeah, I'm going out to dinner with the fam. The fam. The yes. fam. F-A-M. <laughs> the fam. That's kind of a little bit of sort of the informal slang. Like if I wanted to act a little younger than I am, yeah, going out with the fam this weekend. Yeah. Me and the fam went to the cinema. Mm -hmm. Yes. How are you and the fam? Oh, we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Right. How's the fam? Yeah, right. Yeah, we do use that a lot. Anyway, question two, how do you pick a place to go? That's sometimes the hard part when you're going on vacation is just, oh my gosh, so many opportunities, so many places you might want to go. Normally, when it comes to vacation planning, I start by making a list of destinations and whittle it down based on flight prices. Normally, when it comes to vacation planning, I start by making a list of destinations making a list, making a list. So I'll write down all of the places that I want to go to. Maybe a friend just got back from a beach vacation that looked amazing. Or maybe you saw someone going hiking on Instagram. The city, town, location, that is your destination. That is the place you want to spend your holiday, okay? Destination. Now, if you are making a list of destinations, maybe this place, maybe that place, and then your final destination is the place you end up going, the final destination. So I whittle the list down. I whittle it down. W-H-I-T-T-L-E, whittle, whittle. What a funny little phrase whittle something down is to cut the list down. The word whittle comes from um, working with wood. You would take a little knife and you would take the piece of wood and just slowly cut it down until it was the right size. So you're cutting down your list. You are removing items that you don't want. And in this case, the reason I'm removing items from the list or destinations from the list is based on flight prices. So if something is based on something, that's your reasoning for doing that. So if I'm removing some flights, maybe the price is too high. Maybe the connecting flights are really long. Maybe they don't have flights available for the weekend that I want to go. So these are based on flight prices, flight times, connecting flights, etc. So if I'm basing these on flight prices, I'll usually end up with one destination that has good prices, good flights, and then I'm ready to choose that destination and give it a go. Nice. All right. What about you? How do you pick a place to go? 
When sorting out my holidays, I'll have an idea of where I want to go, then use flight prices to narrow it down. So I've used a different phrase with the same meaning as cat to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. I use the same process. I start with a general idea of where I want to go. I want to go to Italy. So I look at the whole country and then I start to look at flights. There's one to Milan, there's one to Rome and whichever one is cheaper, I will start to focus on those cities with the lowest prices or the best flights. So Kat said, whittle it down. I'm going to say, narrow it down. But it's exactly the same meaning. You take out some options until only the best ones are left. It's a phrasal verb, so it behaves like the others. I can narrow down my options. I can narrow my options down mm -hmm. or I can narrow them down because I can always put a pronoun in the middle. Maybe I said, I narrowed it down to two countries and then I chose Mexico. Or if you're asking your friend for help, like I've narrowed it down to two options, but I can't decide. They both sound really great. So when you narrow it down, at the end, you just have two or three options left and then you have to pick one. But all of the options should be good ones because you've narrowed it down. Maybe a slightly British phrase I used was sorting out my holidays. Yeah, very British. Right. Sure. It's a great phrasal verb because it means organizing or planning something. And sort out covers loads of other verbs. You can use sort out for lots of stuff like... I need to sort out the flights. That means I need to go online, buy tickets, but I can say sort out and cover all of that. Or I need to sort out the hotel. That means I need to book the hotel. Or I need to sort out the tour. I need to go downstairs, talk to the receptionist and buy tickets. But sort out covers buy, book, order, organize, plan, Sort out covers all of these verbs. So this is a really good one to know if you're planning anything. Okay. I would say so, we are what? definitely, I would say that we are definitely using that a little bit more often. Um, if there is a problem, we would sort it out. Um, yeah. Solve that problem, sort it out. If we, we also use that as well, like if you have red and blue all mixed up and you want to sort the items, that would be, literally sorting those items and i think that we are starting to use it but it's so funny when i say so sort it out that really kind of almost sounds like something a british person would say and i almost want to say it in a more of a british accent uh -huh. you want to take out all the t's and say sort uh -huh. it out sort it sort out, it out. <laughs> yeah. sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly good i'm glad that one's catching on yes okay <laughs> So uh, you've found a place. Now you need flights to fly there. How do you normally choose a flight? So I really prefer direct flights, but I'll definitely book a connecting flight if the price is right. So I really prefer direct flights, direct flights. We could also call these a nonstop flight. OK, so I really prefer direct flights. That means you are flying one single time from your city to your destination, just one flight. If I live in city A and my vacation destination is city B, I fly from A to B without stopping. We also use uh, a little bit shorter. We can remove the word flight and say, oh, I only fly direct or I only fly nonstop. Or you could say that the flight, that's the, you know, being in the airplane, the moment you lift off and then you touch down, that is a flight. The flight is direct. The flight is nonstop. Now, I usually prefer these nonstop flights. Obviously, it saves us a lot of time. But I'll definitely book a connecting flight if the price is right. So a connecting flight is no longer non-stop, it's with a stop. And a stop means that you are kind of stopping in the middle. Maybe you're flying to a completely different city. It might even be out of the way. 
and then you're flying on to your final destination. So that's taking two or more flights to finally reach your destination. If I'm flying from Houston to New York, but I'm connecting in Atlanta, then I'm taking one flight from Houston to Atlanta, and then a little later, Atlanta to New York. I don't want to go to Atlanta, but it's my connecting flight, and oftentimes these can be a little bit cheaper. So if the price is right, this is even a famous TV show in America called The Price is Right. If the price is right, the, if the flight is much cheaper, or if it really fits my budget, ah, okay, I can spend a couple of extra hours in Atlanta to save a bunch of money. Yeah, so if the pl- if price is right, then I'll definitely take that connecting flight. Do people say connection? I have a connection in Atlanta. I yeah, have a connection in I, New York. I would I would more likely say I'm connecting through Atlanta or I'm flying through Atlanta. I have a connection in Atlanta. Uh, I'm flying through Atlanta. Um, I'm connecting in Atlanta. Those are three different ways. I think most of them are pretty common. So what about you, Mark? How do you normally choose a flight? I usually start by scouring the internet for flights to compare prices and try to find ones that are reasonably priced without any ridiculous layovers. So we'll go from start to finish here. The first word is to scour. I start by scouring the internet. Uh, Literally, I think scour means to clean something or Mm -hmm. scrub it really hard because there's like a tough stain. So to scour, literally, you might scour the tiles or shower, but we use this figuratively to say, look very, very closely or look very, very carefully at everything. So if I'm going to scour the internet for flights, I'm going to look at many, many, many different websites and look at their prices, maybe make notes and compare them to see which one is the best value or which one is cheaper. So I'll spend quite a lot of time looking at lots of different pages and lots of sites. I'm looking for flights that are reasonably priced. I think a reasonably priced flight is the price that I was ready to pay, the price that I was expecting, and a a fair price, in my opinion. Obviously, I would expect a shorter flight to have a lower price and a longer flight to have a higher price. So, okay, if a 12-hour flight is a bit more expensive and it's a direct flight, okay, if it's more expensive, I totally understand. Uh, That is reasonably priced. It's maybe, it's not more expensive than I expected. What I want to really avoid is layovers. So Kat was talking about connections or connecting in a city. When you are in an airport and you're between flights, that period of time, that waiting time can be called a layover. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can have short layovers, like I have a two hour layover in Manchester, or sometimes a longer one, like uh, I had a six hour layover in Beijing, and that was a very long one because none of my apps worked in China. Uh, So I just tried to sleep for six hours on a bench. So that was a long layover. Therefore, a ridiculous layover is something extremely long and inconvenient. Maybe you have to be there overnight, or maybe you have to be there for more than 12 hours. So you may need a hotel or something to deal with this long layover. So I want to avoid those. The price might be super cheap, but I don't want to spend 14 hours in a tiny airport. That's not worth it. I will pay more to avoid that silly layover. Okay, let's go on to the next question. How do you save money when you're booking a holiday? So booking off season helps a lot since I usually want to avoid the crowds during the peak season anyway. Booking off season. Okay, so if you're booking something, that means you're making a reservation in advance. Okay, so if I'm booking a hotel room, booking a flight, that means I'm paying for my spot. 
I'm paying for my spot in advance. I'm letting them know I'm coming. I bought it. Booking off season. So if I'm making a booking, if I'm booking something, then I'm setting the date for the future, right? Especially if I'm booking in advance. So it might be June, it might be May, and I'm thinking, you know, the holidays, this peak season, everybody's at the beach right now. Schools are out, everyone's on summer vacation. There's just gonna be a ton of people at the beach. So let me look at prices. Also, if I'm booking in May or June for a summer vacation, that's really last minute. Lots of hotels are already booked. The crowds are already there. You might not even have very many options for a booking. So booking something off season when all the kids are back at school. Most people are back at work. They're not going to take this time off in the middle. Maybe it's not as popular. Maybe it's a bit cooler at the beach. It's not as hot. So it attracts fewer people. So the off season is that quieter time of the year that's not nearly as popular as the peak season. Now, that could change based on your destination. If I want to go skiing, obviously the off-season would be the summertime because there's no snow to go skiing. So I would get a good price, but I wouldn't get to go skiing in the off-season. <laughs> so a, the peak season for going skiing would obviously be December, January, February, and the off-season for um, a beach vacation would be in the winter time when it's much colder and maybe not as nice to go in the water. If I want to avoid the crowds, if you avoid something, you're trying to stay away from them, keep away from those. So if I know that there are crowds at the beach, I want to book a vacation at a time when they won't be there. So off season, since it's less popular, is a good way to avoid the crowds during that peak season. How do you save money on a booking? That's also why we typically try to travel in shoulder seasons. That way we can avoid the big tourist rush and maybe nab a bargain in the process. So I'm saying kind of the same thing in different words. Uh, Kat used peak season and off season. There is another phrase, shoulder seasons. So the shoulder seasons are the time before the peak season and after the peak season. So imagine before is my left shoulder, the peak is my head, numbers go <laughs> up, more people arrive, and then after the peak season is my oh, that makes right sense. shoulder. Right? Yeah, of so, course. Right? Either side of the spike of the head. <laughs> and same thing, these periods have fewer tourists, fewer people, and hotels want to fill the rooms. They want to sell beds, so they will lower the price to attract people. So that's when we look, we take advantage of those reduced prices in the shoulder seasons. So in Europe, yeah, the peak season is between June and July and August, because again, all the schools are off, it's families and the beaches are super crowded. But if you go in May or September, you're in the shoulder seasons and the prices will be much lower. And if you're lucky, you might still get the same weather. Sometimes mm -hmm. summer just continues a little bit. So yeah, you might get lucky and enjoy all the same weather, but for much less money. Again, in the peak season, there is the tourist rush. Some people only have like five days of their summer holiday. So they try to do lots of activities, visit all the big landmarks. So there's often lots of people and it's very crowded in popular areas and I personally don't enjoy that experience on vacation, so we try to avoid the big tourist rush. And because the prices are so much cheaper, we might nab a bargain in the process. So nab literally means to grab it or actually steal it. If you steal something, you might nab it for free. And it can feel like stealing because sometimes the price is so cheap when you're booking it on the internet, you feel like the website is going to block you or they're going to cancel the ticket because it's so cheap. There's no way that's the real price. This is a mistake, right? 
but you pay for it, it goes through, and you nabbed a bargain. A bargain is a really, really great price, mm -hmm. much cheaper than you were expecting. So, yes, if you go in the shoulder season, you might nab a bargain, save a ton of money. So, next we'll move on to accommodation. How do you usually choose a hotel? So instead of booking a big hotel chain, I like to stay in smaller boutique hotels or a B and B with a host and something homemade for breakfast. So instead of booking a big hotel chain, a chain is something like a big company where they have lots of locations all over the place. A big hotel chain that I can think of would be the Marriott or the Four Seasons or something that you can pretty much find that hotel name in any city that you go to. Even around the world, they might have hotels. So that's good if you are a loyal customer. But instead of booking a big hotel chain, I'm going to do something different. I like to stay in smaller boutique hotels. Boutique. A boutique is a small store. Usually they carry unique items or kind of a different style of items. So that is a boutique store. And a boutique hotel has the same idea. It's much smaller, but you get better service. They're often really trendy and quite intimate because they're a smaller hotel doesn't mean they're less expensive. Sometimes boutique hotels might be more expensive than the chain hotels, but you get a higher level of service. Oftentimes the hotels are very beautiful and they're nicely decorated and you might just feel a little bit more intimate. Intimate is where you feel taken care of. You're not just another person at the hotel. You feel like people know who you are and you also feel like you also know the other people that are staying in the hotel as well. That feels like a boutique hotel. Also, a B and B. It almost is like B N B. B and B. That's why Airbnb became so popular because it does take that B and B, B and B, which it is a bed and breakfast, a bed and breakfast. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a small place. It's usually hosted in a family's home. Sometimes they have maybe like five or six rooms and they're usually found in small towns or in rural areas. And along with getting a good night's sleep, you get a nice breakfast that is usually provided by the host. I quite like B&Bs. They're really quiet. They're often kind of cute, and it sometimes feels like you get to go to your grandma's house. Plus, they usually have a really good breakfast, and I love a free breakfast in the morning, honestly. So how do you choose a hotel? Uh, I also spend a good chunk of time reading reviews online for all-inclusive resorts, ones that have everything taken care of. So here's where our holiday plans start to differ. Kat is interested in a smaller boutique hotel where with a host, uh, with breakfast. I want something that's all inclusive, that has everything taken care of. So that's why I've gone for all inclusive resorts. All inclusive resorts are often these big, sometimes quite luxurious hotels that serve all your meals and maybe all your drinks for one price. You pay for your stay and food, drinks are included in it. So I can drink as much as I want. I can eat as much as I want and I don't have to pay every time. So I want the opposite experience. I want to have everything taken care of. I don't want to go out to find a cafe. I want to stay in the resort and stay in the hotel and maybe have coffee brought to me. Or I can just go downstairs and find coffee and I can relax by the pool. Maybe there's a gym. There are different restaurants for different kinds of food. Um, I can wash my clothes in the laundry service. There's an airport transfer. So if I land, I can just hop on a little bus and go straight there. Everything is taken care of by the resort. So I'm going for the full lazy luxury 
option of the all-inclusive resort. I find my resort because I spend a good chunk of time reading reviews. So a chunk is kind of a big piece. I think of like a chunk of meat as quite a big piece of meat or a big chunk of cake, <laughs> like a really big slice. In terms of time, a chunk of time is quite a lot of time. In this case, we're talking about planning a holiday. So spending a good chunk of time planning a holiday could be days or weeks researching. Maybe every evening I sit down, open my laptop and look at prices for weeks and weeks. That is a good chunk of time because I really want to make sure I get the right resort and have the best experience possible. So you've got the flights, you've got the accommodation. What do you plan to do when you actually get there? Well, as far as sightseeing goes, I usually like to sign up for a city tour with a local guide to get my bearings and then to do some adventuring on my own, eating and drinking along the way. So as far as sightseeing goes, this is kind of a phrase where we're basically saying when it comes to talking about this topic. So as far as sightseeing goes, here's what I would do for sightseeing. I usually like to sign up for a city tour. A city tour is kind of an informational tour that shows you lots of places in the city and you learn about the city at the same time. Sometimes there's a city tour on top of a bus. Sometimes you go around on a bike and you learn a few things. Usually a city tour will give you a pretty good idea of most of the things in the city. Even if you get to see like five or six big sites, you might walk by 10 or 20 smaller things as well. I think of a city tour as usually a couple of hours at least. So you're going to need time to kind of check out everything and you'll get to learn about it from a local guide. If someone is a local, they live in that city or they grew up in that city, even better. Someone that's a local guide is used to the city, knows everything about the city, knows the story of the city, the information, and they are someone that is very helpful, especially if you have any questions. Like, man, I really could go for some traditional food. Are there any good local restaurants, local cafes. Now, again, I'm avoiding those big chains. I don't want to just go to Starbucks on my holiday. I want to actually go to a local place where someone, maybe the owner, is also someone who lives in the city. So instead of going to a big chain, I can go to a smaller place that might be a little bit more unique and might be quite special for the area. I don't think I could probably find that anywhere else. So the reason I like to take a city tour with a local guide is to get my bearings, to get my bearings. If I've never visited a city before, I might not know exactly where I am. So doing a big city tour, when I go to visit those places, oh, wow, I remember seeing that on the city tour. Oh, I know where we are. I saw this on the city tour. If you're getting your bearings, that means you are figuring out where you are. So if I look around and I say, oh, I don't, I'm a little lost, but oh, yeah, I remember seeing that on the city tour. Then I've got my bearings. That means that I know where I am and I feel more confident about where I am as well. So after I've got my bearings, then I'm going to go do some adventuring on my own, eating and drinking along the way. I think I do like to see some sights. I do like to see those kind of fun, popular areas. But I'll be honest, I really just like to eat new food and delicious food. So I'm going to go and do some adventuring, which means that I'm going to be independent. I'm on my own. Um, now, if I said the word alone, it makes it feel kind of a little sad, like I don't want to be by myself. But if I'm doing something on my own, 
feels like I'm very confident, I'm very excited, and I'm doing it on my own. I'm doing it, yeah, yeah, I feel good, I feel good. I took the city tour, I know where I wanna go, I'm really excited, and then I'll be eating and drinking along the way. So as I go from place to place and enjoy myself, if I see a little local cafe, if I see a little local restaurant, I'll just go ahead and head on in and try something eating and drinking along the way. And follow the food. That's like the best yes. advice. Follow the food. Don't forget the sites, the monuments, the statues, whatever. Follow the food. That's like the best <laughs> advice I've heard for traveling. Yes. yes. And so what about you, Mark? What do you plan to do when you get there? When it comes to actual sightseeing, I know we can simply book a tour at the front desk, then just sit back and relax and enjoy ourselves. So uh, at the very, very beginning of the episode, Kat mentioned actually. Actually has lots of different definitions and I've used actual in a different way as well. When it comes to actual sightseeing, Kat used actually at the beginning to mean surprisingly, like we thought it would be bad, but actually it was quite good. That was a surprise. Here, I'm using actual to mean like literally, like when it comes to literally sightseeing. So going to a place, looking at it, taking a picture, and then checking it off my list. Actual sightseeing is literally physically going to the places and doing it. It's kind of the reason you expect people to go on vacation is to see something new or see something quite famous or beautiful. So I'm using actual here to be literal. You can use this kind of jokingly. Maybe one of your friends went to the beach, they went sunbathing, and they got really badly sunburned. You might say, he actually looks like a lobster. <laughs> or he's, his skin is actually like pink. It is so burned. So actually can be literally here. Or because truly done... or really, I think too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really burned, laterally. Um, I've gone for the all-inclusive, so I can just go to the front desk, the reception or the reception area, and they will have a selection of activities for me. So I can book a tour or I can sort out a tour at the front desk and then just sit back and relax. This is sort of a semi-fixed phrase, which means you can change one or two words. Sit back is often used to mean relax, get comfortable, don't do anything. You don't have to worry about anything. Just sit back and relax. Someone else is handling things. Um, if you get on a plane, you might hear the pilot on the speaker say, sit back and enjoy your flight. So sit back, I'm flying the plane. Don't worry, you just sit back and relax. Don't, don't so, sit up being stressed, being too too yeah. tense just just sit back sit back sit back you're okay mm. sit back yeah that's yeah the comfortable sit back. Position. you're okay you're all right sit just sit back. back and relax yes right yeah so at the resort i like to sit back and relax by the pool or after a busy day i just want to sit back and enjoy the movie with no interruptions i just want to be calm and comfortable and relaxed so there you go that's our entire script, that's both sides, the American and the British version, and then two slightly different holiday experiences side by side. Uh, like always, we love to read your comments. So do you have a vacation planned soon? Or do you have any holiday plans? Is there a place that you'd really, really like to go? Or do you usually have the same kind of vacation every time you travel? Do you prefer my all-inclusive resort or does cat's holiday sound more exciting to you let us know we reply to all the comments and read all of them and uh, we really appreciate all the feedback and subscriptions we've had so far so thank you guys yes and we want to give a big thanks to all of our members and everybody that has been asking great questions it helps us to really um 
figure out what you guys are wondering about, figuring out what you guys have questions about. And it really helps us to become better teachers to be able to explain something to you that maybe we missed out on in the video. So if you do have a question, if you do have any doubts about uh, what went on, you can also double check in our transcript. And every single member, as if you join in our members only group here on YouTube, you get all of our PDF transcripts. So if you're not not exactly sure or you don't quite remember what we said in our video you can check out that transcript and use those as a study guide as well so thank you so much everyone we will see you for our next episode thank you goodbye bye thank you